Dr. Vinod Balakrishnan, Associate Professor, Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, uh, research scholars and students uh, to this special lecture. This special lecture is arranged in the context of uh, National Education Day, which is celebrated every year on 11th November. Since 11th November, that is tomorrow, is a holiday. We have arranged this lecture today. Uh, this National Education Day was announced by the Government of India in commemoration with the birth anniversary of Maulana Abdul Kalam Asad, an eminent educationist, freedom fighter, and he was the first Union Minister of Education. This audience need no introduction about Dr. Vinod Balakrishnan. He is a well-known orator in this part of the country. Also, he is a very famous teacher in this campus. It is my pleasure to invite Dr. Vinod Balakrishnan to give a lecture. Madam Nadumani, Dean Academic Affairs, NIT Ruchi, my good friend and Associate Dean Academic, Dr. Karbibu, colleagues in the scholarly pursuit of knowledge, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to be here before you on occasion of the National Education Day. We remember today a great mind who has been a significant part of our history. And this talk captures the spirit of uh, Maulana Abul Kalam Azad, what he meant to the country in his time and what he means to us today. He was uh, Maulana Azad, very popularly. Maulana standing for the master scholar and Azad free. And I thought in one sense that phrase symbolizes the uh, spirit of my talk today which is about the pursuit of knowledge which is unfettered, unbridled in a spirit of absolute freedom. Maulana Azad. About the person all of us know he was the youngest president of the Indian National Congress. At uh, 35, in 1923, he headed the National <coughs> Congress. He was India's first education minister. And interestingly, he was born in Mecca, today Saudi Arabia. And uh, so from the Mecca of Mecca, to Delhi, it has been a very eventful journey. And we are talking about a polymath, one who was a scholar in Persian, in Urdu, in Arabic, in Hindi, and English. So for somebody who used to write brilliant poetry, he also had a mind with a vision to establish the IITs in this country. So we owe it to him for 
the establishment of the IITs in this country. We owe it to him for the establishment of the University Grants Commission, UGC, the All India Council for Technical Education. And then, as a poet, he was the one who conceived and um, set into motion the activities of the Sahiti Academy, the uh, literary and cultural um, organization of this country, the Sangeet Natak Academy, and so on. So, one who has been a significant um, part of our history. And in this person, we would see the happy harmony of science and the humanities. And that is the way in which I would like to take this talk forward, that if our universities must have any relevance, if our centers of higher education and educational excellence must have any meaning today, it can only be possible with the happy marriage of uh, the sciences with humanities. This because we have a director from Jamia Milia Islamia. We would like to place on record that uh, Maulana Azad was one of the founding um, members of uh, the Jamia Milia Islamia University at Aligad UP. And today, Gate 7 is uh, named after him. What is interesting about Jamia Milia Islamia is that it was a university started in India refusing all assistance from the colonial masters, the British. So, in a sense, it reflected the decolonized mentality of not going to the masters, your colonial masters, for any kind of assistance. And so it symbolizes an institution that is um, completely independent and stands for itself. The idea of the decolonized mind, to me, comes from, I borrow from the great Kenyan writer, who in 1986 spoke about the role of language in creating a nation's culture, history, and identity. I'm talking about Gugi Wa Thiongo. And uh, Maulana Azad, as part of uh, the founding of an organization, an institution that refused any kind of help from the British masters, was also a decolonized mind. And in that respect, continues in a long tradition of decolonized minds that have guided the destiny of education in this country. I'm talking about Swami Vivekananda, I'm talking about Rabindranath Tagore, I'm talking about Sri Aurobindo and Mahatma Gandhi, all of them having thought deep and extensively on the philosophy of education. A quote that captures the vision of Maulana Azad reads like this, and I quote, Educationists should build the capacities of the spirit of inquiry, creativity, entrepreneurial, and moral leadership among students and become their role models. Now, it's saying a lot. The rest of my talk is a way of elaborating how educationists build capacities of the spirit of inquiry, creativity, entrepreneurial, and moral leadership. In 1939, the Harper's Magazine published a manifesto of a unique university. Ten years before this publication was the great Wall Street crash, and we had the biggest financial meltdown in history, especially in American history. But weeks before Wall Street could crash, Louis Bamberger and his sister Carolyn B. Fuld sold their New York department store to Macy's, and they made a huge 
profit. It was a windfall. So with this unexpected fortune, they wanted to start a medical institution of the highest standards without racial, religious or ethnic biases. The man who wrote this manifesto of this unique university, Abraham Flexner, convinced the Bambergers that uh, they would start a different kind of an institute that would be dedicated to unrestricted scholarship, which comes with the attractive perks that you would not have to teach students you would not be called to involve in administrative responsibilities and so on. In 1930, in about a year's time, the Princeton Institute for Advanced Study was established in New Jersey. And from 1933, it saw the contributions of such phenomenal minds as Einstein, von Neumann, and so on. In 1939, April 30, Flexner published this watershed article titled The Usefulness of Useless Knowledge. He had been a victim of the great financial crash and recession, but with his brother's support, he completed his education he went on to look at educational practices in Europe and in different educational centers across the globe and started with a trenchant critique of the American university system. And so he wanted the Princeton Center for Advanced Study to be very different from any that the world had seen till then. He meant it to be a paradise for scholars where they would concentrate on deep thoughts which were far removed from mundane considerations and everyday um, practical applications. Flexner had a great faith in two principles. One, human curiosity, because that is the engine that drives all our quest, and serendipity, which happens to only those who are capable of a great scholastic adventure. And what the unobstructed pursuit of useless knowledge does is it synergizes human curiosity and uh, serendipity. One instance of how this useless knowledge serendipitously becomes one of the most useful applications in modern time is, uh, begins with the 1905 paper of Albert Einstein on the theory of relativity. And from 1905, nothing much is known about the application of this theory and it continues to be in the realms of the highest performances in uh, um, thinking in the physical world. But after 73 years, there was a felt need for space-based navigation systems, and these systems would have to factor location and time. So one needed to read the time signals of orbiting satellites. Now, the Earth's gravitational field and the movement of satellites caused clocks to either speed up or slow down. And this meant that per day there would be a loss of or a skipping of something like 38 milliseconds in terms of time. Now without Einstein's theory of relativity, we would have developed a GPS would have, which would have been inaccurate to the extent of about 7 kilometers. But today we are talking about a GPS which has an accuracy which is even less than 5 meters. Now, that is what we mean by the usefulness of useless knowledge. There is an arc of knowledge, and in order to illustrate this further, 
I would pitch the beginning some 2,000 years ago. I call this arc of knowledge for an instance in this talk, I would call it the arc of thermodynamics because it's a fascinating story. And through that, we would be able to see the universal brotherhood of scientists, people who are located in different centers of scholastic quest, but then they all seem to be bound together in a spirit of brotherhood, of sharing, and of uh, the pure love for knowledge. In 1650, Otto von Gerich in Germany developed the first vacuum pump after his famous Magdeburg Hemispheres experiment. But why did Gerich develop a vacuum pump? Because of his undying curiosity about challenging a statement that had been in existence for over 2,000 years. Assuming that Aristotle was 34 years old when he stated famously that nature abhors a vacuum, that nature hates a vacuum, and this statement of Aristotle had been in existence for about 2,000 years to the day when Otto von Gerich wanted to challenge it, and he did that with his vacuum pump. Six years after Gerich performed his experiments, Robert Boyle, located in England, heard of Gerich's design, and along with Robert Hooke, he built the first air pump, which correlated pressure, temperature, and volume. Soon, Boyle's law was developed, pressure declared to be inversely proportional to volume. In 1679, and we are now looking at something like a generation after Otto von Gerich, in 1679, Dennis Papin, Boyle's assistant, using the con concept, developed a steam digester, but this was a closed vessel. So when pressure built up, there was a possibility that it would explode. And Papin, because he was a scientist, developed a, um, um, a release valve, a pressure release valve, and uh, he also um, provided the first insights into a piston and cylinder, which he was not um, successful in carrying to its logical conclusion. It had to wait for two other people. In 1697, Thomas Savory built the first engine using Papin's design. And in 1712, Thomas Newcomen developed another crude engine. But it was a it was, it was an instrument maker working for a University of Glasgow professor, Joseph Black, James Watt, who thought of an external condenser to increase the efficiency of this engine. And we had the first steam engine. After an interim of about 50 years, around 1824, there is this young Frenchman, Sadi Carnot, who was also working for the French army. But then Sadi Carnot went to the Ecole Polytechnique, where he was taught by such legendary teachers as Ampere. He was taught by these great teachers, and uh, he writes a remarkable book, not a, a, a very lengthy tome, he writes a remarkable book titled Reflections on the Motive Power of Fire, which is a discourse on heat, power, energy, engine efficiency. And the energetic relations among Carnot's engine, Carnot's cycle, motive power, gives birth to a field we today recognize as thermodynamics. And in 1859, about 100 years after Otto von Gerich developed the first air pump, we have William Rankin at the University of Glasgow producing the first textbook on thermodynamics. This is an arc of knowledge. 
it's about, it takes about a hundred years for the first and second laws of thermodynamics to emerge from the experiments of Otto von Gehrig. Now, we have to call this knowledge useless because for much too long in its evolution, people are still struggling to find clues to its everyday application. But then, when the moment and the man come together, there has to be a serendipitous find, and then it becomes useful. The problem today with most institutions, and that is a problem that John Henry Cardinal Newman didn't talk about, because he was talking in a context of liberal education. But that is certainly the problem that Stephen Colini addresses, a professor of intellectual history at Oxford, when he talks about the problem with our universities and colleges, he addresses the problem of funding. The problem today is that funding is drying up. And the economic conditions in the world are so uncertain. And we have a global political condition that is always in a state of flux. You are unable to predict the headlines of your newspaper. It's certainly very different from what George Washington used to say about the newspaper, that you, if you have read it one day, you can predict the newspaper for the next 11 days. And that's certainly not the case. The newspaper of the morning is so different from the midday newspaper. And uh, you have an altogether very startling development in the evening. And that is the speed at which the global political situation is changing. And then today we have very short time cycles. Now the result of all these developments is that it hits research very hard. Research criteria are skewed on account of these conditions to serve short term goals. So while it may seem that we are solving our immediate problems, and that's only apparent, we are actually not uh, benefiting from or taking advantage of uh, human imagination. Now, we should try to find why or have convincing answers to why we should be spending um, a lot of our time and energy on basic research. Number one, and an obvious reason is that basic research advances knowledge in itself and of itself. So even if the theory of relativity is not going to have very tangible applications, the theory of relativity is still worth pursuing in itself as a fine philosophical um, exploration of a physicist. Number two, we should be concentrating on basic research because path-breaking research leads to new tools and techniques. And these tools and techniques often are developed in very unpredictable ways. One instance would be that when thousands of particle physicists working at the CERN, the Particle Accelerator Laboratory, needed a collaboration tool an automatic information sharing software, they were not aware or nobody thought that they would be creating an unexpected spin-off in the form of the World Wide Web, which today it was with them in 1989 and it reached public domain in 1993. This unexpected development has sparked off a communication revolution today. The third reason why we should be spending a lot of our energy on basic research is that there are more young scholars coming into the field today and each one is bringing a new way of thinking, a radical approach to the age-old problems. So we have people interested in mathematics as a, an elegant language to do abstract science. And uh, what would start off as a quantitative analysis can find 
its application in predicting a possible famine to even predicting financial disasters. And today, knowledge from basic research is so accessible given the internet that it is possible for us to move from the idea to the implementation in a very short time. And uh, the fifth reason why we should be concentrating on basic research is that some of their beautiful spin-offs are going to result in the form of startups, which are once again the products of innovation and the incubation systems that places like MIT have developed. MIT alone has given birth to something like 30,000 companies and uh, MIT's contribution today serves in, in terms of the economy, um, it is something like 4.6 million employees. So we are looking at what can advantages can come off encouragement in the basic research, in, in basic research. Now, in order to do research or do basic research, it is not enough that we think only as scientists. We need to believe that human imagination is a field that needs to be exploited for its tangible results and not something to be dismissed. The Dutch chemist Jacobus Enricus van Toff is the first Nobel laureate in chemistry. When he was appointed professor at the University of Amsterdam, he defended the role of creativity in his inaugural speech, Imagination in Science. And there he quoted Michael Faraday, a very interesting character. Michael Faraday's father was a blacksmith. Faraday himself wanted to be an apprentice to a bookbinder. And it is a chance visit to one of the London science fairs where Sir Henry, where um, Davy, Sir Davy was giving lectures on science that Faraday is enthralled by these lectures and he takes notes on Davy's lectures, Humphrey Davy's lectures and sends those transcripts to him which flowers into one of the most productive relationships in a laboratory and Faraday goes on to invent or discover for us electricity. And there is one apocryphal story about Faraday when the Prime Minister Gladstone visited his laboratory. He was amused and wanted to know from Faraday as to what use all of these experiments would uh, lead to. And Faraday is famously known to have replied, Sir, one day you will have to tax electricity. So, that is how prophetic it turns out. And this is Faraday, who was quoted by Jacobus Henricus Van Toff. I quote, Do not suppose that I was a very deep thinker, and this is Faraday speaking, or was marked as a precautious person. I was a very lively, imaginative person and could believe in the Arabian Nights as easily as in the encyclopedia. So, we don't have to be apologetic about the fact that because you are in the sciences, um, you don't have to or you have to condescend to uh, indulge the imagination. You have Faraday's approval for indulging in both. And as for Einstein, his attestation for imagination is, it's more important than knowledge, he says. For knowledge is limited to all we now know and understand, while imagination embraces the entire world and all there ever will be to know and understand. So we need to take all these horses together. And from a very unlikely source, we have an equally meaningful uh, statement. 
This is the Duke of Wellington who conquered Napoleon at Waterloo. And he had uh, indulged in a game of taking his guests to an unknown part of the countryside where they would be given a landscape and they would have to guess the landscape behind a hill. And from this game or pastime, Duke Wellington has the insight and he says, all the business of life is to endeavor to find out what you don't know by what you do. That's what I call guessing what was at the other side of the hill. Now, we need to do basic research so that our imagination coupled with serendipity would help us see what is on the other side of the hill. I made a mention of um, John Henry Cardinal Newman. In November 21, 1852, he laid out the idea of a university in a series of lectures. And there he talks about the university being able to create the culture of the intellect. We're talking about a campus which has an environment where the intellect can flower. And it has to be through a liberal imagination which brings the mind into form. Now, in a different way, Vivekananda talks about education that brings out the perfection that's already there in man. Newman talks about bringing the mind into form. But what we need to avoid, and that is a problem we need to fight with everyday indulgences on WhatsApp or Facebook, there is a certain viewiness that comes into our life, a certain spurious philosoph philosophism, a kind of opinion making on a variety of subjects. A small example would be that very famous narrative by Manu S. Pillay on the um, kingdom of Travancore where he tracks the life of Sedu Lakshmi Bai. And it starts with the arrival of Vasco da Gama on the shores of Kerala. Any history teacher would tell you that Vasco da Gama was the first person to land on Indian shores. But we seldom realize that the teacher has been guilty of what Newman would call viewiness or a spurious philosophism. Maybe because history goes by large markers, we would want to see Vasco da Gama as the person who landed. But then, if you are a sensitive historian, and if you are sensitive to how individuals would behave when they are in strange locations, especially a person like Vasco da Gama, who would have lived under a threat of a mutiny all through the journey to Kerala from Portugal, he would have, um, um, he would have been like any captain, very careful, cautious in sending somebody else to test the waters and advance guard to see how friendly or hostile the strange land is. And uh, that is exactly what happened. Manu S. Pillay opens this narrative in a very interesting way. He says, it was not Vasco da Gama who landed on the shores of Kerala first. It was one of those dangerous criminals from the gutters of Lisbon who actually landed on the shores of uh, Kerala, uh, which is uh, more true as a historical narrative. So we need to have a certain sensitivity to read between the lines of our historical narratives and a certain curiosity, the curiosity that we would see in an Otto von Gerich, the curiosity that we would see in an Einstein would probably um, take us to see um, what is beyond the stated and give us the truth with greater clarity. I would now like to put together the idea of this environment or the idea of a university um, from two positions. The first position is a personal position. And the second position is an institutional position. For the personal position, 
I take a person like Narayan Murthy, and for institutional position, I would take any institution. The personal position is when Narayan Murthy graduated in computer science, and he wanted to do something meaningful. There were two things that he did. One, he went into himself and organized himself to see what he could do with his learning. And then there was also a fortuitous incident in his life which made it possible for him to crystallize his thoughts. The first part of this journey was a journey of introspection. And uh, this is an account you would read in the introduction to this book, A Better India, A Better World. And he talks about a journey that he makes in, from Bulgaria to Turkey for befriending a couple and for being misunderstood by the local police. He is arrested and uh, imprisoned. But then the foreign office realizes, passport is also impounded, but the foreign office realizes that uh, this person belongs to India, which is a friend of Bulgaria, so they deport him. And he is put on a goods train, a freight train that travels from Nice in Bulgaria to Istanbul in Turkey. And this is a journey of about 108 hours. And for about 48 hours prior to this 108 hour journey, Narayan Murthy had nothing to eat. So he was hungry, he had no money on him because he had not changed the currency into the local currency and he was on this journey. But he says that was a transformative journey, a journey with himself. He had nobody to talk to, he was locked inside a compartment and for about 108 hours he had to grapple with himself. But this, he said, was a godsend, and he still secretly thanks those military officers who put him on this uh, train and on this journey to Istanbul. Because then he realizes that there is something called capitalism in the world, but then the way capitalism is practiced or capitalism manifests in this world is by ruthless competition, by a little unethical um, means, and so he tries to put together three important and interesting ideas. The first one is the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism by Max Weber, from which he gets the idea of the results of hard work, a work ethic he develops, and he believes that you should not be um, a recipient of a free lunch. If you deserve something, you have to earn it. And never count on the largesses of other people, on the benefactions from others. So you work hard for your advantages. The second one is my experiments with truth, Mahatma Gandhi, from where he takes the idea of leading by example. One who, uh, uh, this is a site where you develop the practice of doing something before you can talk about it. So a lot of credibility comes in when you do something and then you are in a position to arbitrate on its value. And the third text that completes this uh, formation, intellectual formation, is this humanistic concern that he captures from Franz Fanon's book Black Skin, White Masks, and it is about how there are social and political forces which divide people on the basis of their color, on the basis of their efficiency, and so on. And these kinds of discriminatory practices um, have to be fought. And this humanistic concern he <coughs> draws from the Algerian physician and thinker, Franz Fanon. And he puts all these ideas together, the Protestant ethic of Max Weber, the idea of truth and leadership from Mahatma Gandhi, and the concern for a fellow human being. He puts them together to compose an idea which is apparently oxymoronic, but a brilliant idea <laughs> called compassionate capitalism. So you 
cannot but be a capitalist in today's competitive world. You need money and you need enough money to realize your dreams, but then it should not be earned at uh, the expense of human values, ethical practices, and so on. So that's at the level of the individual. So when we do basic research, as we say, we would need certain ethical practices, not always being slaves of the results that have to come, but being ethically um, diligent in the way the methodology is adopted for uh, the practices involved. And science not for its own sake, but also with a certain concern for another human being. Now, the institution can also provide an environment, and that is possible when the, the environment in an institution facilitates interdisciplinarity, where people are able to talk across disciplines, where people don't remain in, in silos of their own narrow specializations, where they are able to build bridges across disciplines. And uh, so we would soon be building a network of intellectual formations, and that is possible only if the environment facilitates interdisciplinarity. Today, when you talk about linguistics, you just don't listen to a linguist or a language specialist. You listen to a philosopher of language. You listen to a neuroscientist who has done enough work on cognitive, um, on the way the, the nerves are organized, the, the brain cells are organized. You talk to a cognitive psychologist about how learning happens in human beings and so on. So today it is interdisciplinarity which is the norm. And after that, we need to encourage a kind of a culture where analysis and speculation go hand in hand. One must not put down speculation as that as something which is unscientific, but you would need to encourage speculation because speculation complements analysis. The example of the <laughs> criminal from Portugal landing um, on the shores of Kerala is not just analysis, but then very delicious speculation also making it possible, complementing it in a very good way. And then the third one is we need to have an environment where there is a critique of common sense. Now, it is possible to think that we are, with our modern gadgets, a very advanced um, tribe of people and that our forefathers did not have these technologies and so they existed in a more primitive um, condition. That is certainly not the case. Common sense leads us into a number of fallacies and this is a diachronic fallacy. One would have to ask if we would be able to peel a mango with the chip of a stone and then you would understand how we fall short of the standards that this Stone Age man had for dexterity. And because your surgeons use a high-grade stainless steel scalpel doesn't mean that we have somehow become technologically advanced um, with, in relation to the Stone Age man. It has to be seen synchronously and in context. And we should also have an environment where thinking for itself is encouraged. People are appreciated just for thinking and not put down as people who generate stupid thoughts or unviable thoughts. One of the greatest minds of uh, the 20th century and every post-war thinker of some merit in this world has gone back to this German philosopher called Heidegger, a very complex, very difficult mind, but then a very fascinating person. He is so poetic, um, so humane, and one of the finest documents that we can read and appreciate are his uh, elucidations on Holden's poetry and his own beautiful um, letter on humanism. And uh, Heidegger says, after a whole um, career in philosophy, Heidegger comes back to basic thinking. And he says, what Western philosophy has done from Plato is to celebrate a certain technological viewpoint. And it has also disproportionately privileged the human. And so you had the Renaissance 
um, arrogance that the noblest piece of creation is man. But then he says, what we have lost is a certain sensitivity. Emerson also talks about it in Self-Reliance. He says, the modern man has built a coach but has lost the use of his feet. And, uh, and it is in this uh, connection I thought I would put uh, two slides on the um, uh, board for you. The first one is something that you would love to possess, which is the, yeah, you would know from the swoosh that this is the Nike shoe and you would not mind spending any amount of money just to be seen wearing a Nike. But that is a product of technology. That is what a machine has given you. That certainly is a very good case for technological development. But the next one, the next slide, is uh, what is not so very graceful. It certainly is not a branded pair of shoes and it is certainly not the pair of shoes you would want to even touch with a barge board, right? A leave alone be seen wearing it. But Heidegger would say that uh, this painting is more meaningful than that exquisite photo of the Nike shoe. That's because this is a painting by Van Gogh, and Van Gogh, the great painter, would see in this pair of shoes the life of a peasant. He would also, by putting his spirit into this painting, communicate to you the long distances that peasant walked, the blisters and the pain that the peasant, the blisters on his soles and the pain that the peasant suffered on account of it. This also talks about life's experience that the peasant has gathered and in the bargain the shoes have to be like this, it gets broken and it needs mending. Now, what our thinking must take us towards is not a very simple acceptance of what is given, but a greater immersion into a sensitive humanistic thinking. And our universities must provide an environment where not just technology is celebrated, but then the beautiful aspect of the human is also appreciated, in fact, a little more than technology. I would close with this beautiful image from uh, um, Boris Pasternak's classic Dr. Shivago, the eponymous hero of uh, this Russian novelist. Dr. Shivago is a doctor by training, but he is also a poet by passion. So um, a scientist is a Dr. Shivago who is part doctor, who works with science, who works to provide <coughs> solutions to the human body, and then he's also a poet who tries to heal the wounds of the soul with the beautiful reverberations from the created word. And that environment of the university is meaningful to me, which can bring together the excellence of technology and science, which goes hand in hand with the finest humanistic sentiments. And on that note, thank you for this opportunity.
Thank you. Mm. Mm.